Um, thanks everyone for being here at the end of a long weekend, um, and especially to Nadine and Cora Crit, who are here all the way from the Lower East Side and Midtown, respectively. Um, my name is Robin. I edit a magazine called Leap in Beijing, where the bilingual bi monthly uh, Chinese international, sorry, Chinese English magazine of international contemporary art for China. Um, this is our second year doing a program with a uh, field meeting, and we're really excited to be back with a smaller group this year to have some really tight conversations. We were just brainstorming in the hallway, and we couldn't decide whether we wanted to take our clothes off, turn the lights off, or throw things at you, so we'll probably do all three at some point. Um, no, uh, the lecture performance thing was really interesting to learn about, and so we're going to try to do a little bit more of a lecture and less of a performance for this. So Nadim is going to start by introducing uh, some of his work, and then Cora Pro will talk about uh, a couple projects he's been working on as well. I guess the reason uh, we wanted to bring this group together uh, was to offer something of a counterpoint to this idea of the lecture performance, kind of rather than thinking of performance in ephemeral terms, to think about how liveness actually ends up uh, being coded into exhibitions by artists. Uh, both Nadim and Corcoran have done uh, works that involve uh, human actors at various points, um, but primarily work kind of in space. Uh, so I think it's interesting to think through how these different media, uh, film, live performance, and spatial installation can work together to kind of approximate uh, the sort of feeling of performance. It's something that, that Crid and I have been talking a lot about lately, um, which I've been writing um, on his performance and exhibition in, in Beijing over the summer. Uh, so I'm looking forward to kind of sharing a lot of what we've learned, but also to hopefully get into the next step of that research. Uh, so Nadine, you can take us away. Okay. Um, uh, that is um, like this conversation that we're having in terms of how I'm going to talk about it. Um, could be framed in the sense of thinking about performance uh, uh, outside of, of, of the body, not the, that's the human body. Um, I mean, what's, we're going to be talking about, I guess, in a sense, the way in which uh, objects take on this character of, of, of a performative thing. And uh, in relationship to my work, um, that is, uh, it, it's related to this question um, of the image and how the object presents itself uh, as an image. So, um, and, and my work in general um, basically deals with uh, the nature of the image uh, and the circulation of images and how these images are perceived and also how they change the way that we, we uh, understand the world. So, um, yeah, so I'm just going to try and go through uh, a few works. I might edit as I go along. It's prepared quite a lot, but there's probably not enough time. Um, this is, yeah, just, just have a quick look. Um, yeah, so this is a, uh, an installation that, that I set up uh, a number of years ago. It consists of a room uh, that you see through a frame. And uh, when you see the room, um, I think uh, it, it would appear as, as an image of source, something like a mirror or a photograph or something like that. Um, but very quickly, as you, as you look at the, the work, um, certain kinds of inconsistencies start to crop up. And uh, you begin to realize that the image inside the room is, in fact, a, another room. That's, that's the room open up from the inside. And, um, and I think, uh, yeah, so I mean, this would be, a, I think, a, a, a way of framing what I want to talk about. Um, there's this question, I think, uh, of, of liveness that, that, that we were mentioning earlier. And uh, when it comes to the image, uh, at least in terms of, of the image of, of, of space or, or of a kind of present moment, 
Um, I think usually uh, the present uh, or the way that we experience space is obscured by the daily use. Um, you know, so like, you know, when I'm using this cup, I don't really see it as an image because I'm drinking from it, I'm using it. So, it, so the image of the cup disappears uh, with the daily use. So in, in some sense, of what I was interested in doing was to try and uncover um, or, or recover the image of the object uh, outside of its normal uh, usage. And um, some of the ways that I did this was to, in this case, to uh, deconstruct the language of photography and in some, in some sense reverse engineer uh, a live situation uh, that would look like a photograph uh, or a mirror, uh, but would not be, it would be an actual three-dimensional space. Um, sorry? Uh, and the same, so the same thing uh, applies to, to a later work, uh, where I would use the same kind of um, uh, idea, but use different kinds of framing mechanisms. In this case, it's, it was uh, light, the spotlight. And um, this is an ex 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 existing space in a factory in London, um, which I basically cleaned and reconstructed. So um, I, I had a theater spotlight, uh, which I shone onto the space, and I cleaned up um, the parts that were illuminated. Uh, so when, when, when you went to the exhi exhibition, you would see this very kind of uh, glittery, shiny space. But at the same time, you, you, know, you wouldn't really know what was happening uh, until you sort of cast your shadow onto the space. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this piece. This piece will take <laughs> So uh, this is another work that I did. Um, and when I'm talking about images, I think I'd like to stress this, the, the question of distance. And uh, this is a work which was a one-to-one -one reconstruction of, of an urban landscape, uh, I understand. And, and it was made to be a, a um, to be to only exist for the duration of the exhibition. So it, it was a sand sculpture, and uh, it was it was put there, and and I didn't really have any indication as to whether you know people would, could uh, jump into it or not. Uh, but um, the, the the exhibition setting by itself created this tension where people would would immediately uh, stand up, stand up. There was a sort of immediate. Uh, convention that, that prevented people from actually jumping into the work. And uh, I think that kind of threshold that you have between, between uh, be it an image or an object or a sculpture or a photograph or a painting, um, is what gives it that imaginary quality. Because if you're standing back and you're looking at something, um, you look at it as an image. Whereas if you jump into it, you, you become immersed in it and you, you become part of it and the image disappears. So that, that is a kind of essential component uh, to a lot of the work that I do. Um, and <laughs>
was screened off by this best specs uh, window. So in that sense, uh, this is almost a literal uh, description of, of this relationship, that, that you have the interior uh, that you cannot really access uh, except by sticking your hands in and sort of playing around with it. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. And for me, Nadim, your work evokes so much uh, this sort of drama of the stage set, this kind of, you work in an architectural way, but you create this uh, using sort of props and scenery, this stage um, on which uh, characters can, can perform, whether that's objects in your work. Um, but I would like to propose is that what you're really doing is creating kind of a, a psychological performance. You're inviting um, your viewer to come forward and kind of allow these psychodramas to play out um, between them and the piece and ultimately between them and you. I think everyone who's sort of in your sterilized bedroom here has this role of like the alienated lover, the, the lover spurned, kind of uh, mediated by technology and sort of this post-biological condition. Um, which is maybe something we can talk about in, in a few minutes. We can wrap with that for, for the moment. Um, Chris, do you want to jump into yeah. yours? Five to ten minutes. Yeah. Hi, so I guess um, <coughs> the idea of uh, liveness, I guess, is like, or in general, like, um, kind of like experiencing life, or um, I guess how. Uh, Yes, for me, I've been doing one project for the past like four years, and it's about kind of creating this this like very rounded rounded three D image of an, an author or an artist, you know, and trying to kind of like start from media of like this kind of like very uh, um, I guess you would call like relatable idea of a, a painter or right, an artist, and then from there to try and like fit as much like content from what you'd say like um, life and so on like in relationships and you know in into the, the work um, so the I kind of made a slideshow that like went through like the journey I guess or the transformation of this this character um so the first this is a what is it from it's it's broken down into a the slides. Is it right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, the first part of this, uh, it's a, it's broken down into a trilogy, but actually with four parts. The first part is um, um, it's always kind of like, it's always like two two parts. Um, sorry. It's always a kind of like balancing like two kind of separate parts and trying to like define a space in between. So the first one was um my my life in the year two thousand eleven to two thousand twelve and um my grandparents' life in that year as they my grandfather has Alzheimer's or so he's like losing his memory and I was kind of like um kind of wrapping up like my art practice up to that point and trying to like sort of relate this art practice it was kind of made here in um, America, like back to my life there. So it's also the year 2012, so anticipating like the, the flood. This was like a, a funeral. Um, and then the second one was like uh, in the year 2013, sorry, 12 to 13. And um, the guy on the left is uh, sort of like the National artist of Thailand is famous for building a temple. The one on the right is um, the a sex worker. They got paid to go on TV to do this body painting, and this is like the national news of them. Um, sort of like the guy, the national artist, um, critiquing the work on the right. And this was a key moment in making this painter. Like I thought about the the Buddhist artist. The idea of like Buddhism is almost like the consciousness of Thailand and sort of the sex industry is like kind of like the unconsciousness and then this artist um, would kind of try to become both at the same time. 
to me now just body painting. Um, you know, and this painter like, kind of his his medium of the ground in which the story is built is denim. Um, and then the third part, uh, which is the, the the third part of the trilogy, was um, I have a twin brother, so me and my twin brother, him playing the character of me and me playing him, uh, we go to, this is a temple built by the, the Thai Buddhist artist on the left. So we go to this temple, and then we go to this other temple that's um, very similar to Scientology, but in China. And then, and then this is a, uh, in between, the in between the middle, the third part and the end, there was um sort of like a special part, a special video that was sort of like the inverse to the second part. So the if the second part was about becoming a body painting, a body painter, the the inverse to it would be sort of like a soap commercial made to, uh, as a like, kind of like a propaganda for for the religion, <laughs> for this, the Scientology ish. Buddhist religion or something like that. So there's a silk commercial. There's a performer called Boy Shout. Um, so she played, she takes the role of basically me, this denim painter, and has this cleaning. Um, this is my twin sort of making these um, paintings. Um, these, uh, the paintings were uh, they're, they're, they're kind of tourist photos, abstracted of details of um, the, the white temple that we visited. Um, and then the, the whole idea of liveness and even like places have like having a kind of like somehow like like a place like like this white temple becoming this kind of like active um, place that you know like. Because the idea of change is like pretty important in recording change, you know, because this project was done over like four years. So this is an earthquake happened to the temple, and so that that kind of that arc was a that kind of like collapsed back into the narrative. It's kind of loss of memory, loss of place that things that keep memories. Um, this was the ending to uh, the. <coughs> Third part, it's like running into the ocean, and then the, and then um the fourth part to the trilogy, which is kind of framed as the epilogue, or kind of the part that like brings everything together, was in um. Uh, Uh, so so in the in the format there's not enough time for me to show the video but in the format of the video I guess the video the video plays in this I started making video from watching um, in the beginning watching San Soleil which is this kind of letter form of like uh, the author kind of writing a letter to um, like sort of like a character reading the text and then in a way that character reading the, the letter is sort of like the audience, but through like a filter. So for me, like in all these videos, I was addressing a character called Shantri, who's sort of like someone who you maybe used to be close or far away, and I would like tell these stories about like what I've been doing like the past summer. Um, so to think about Shantri as this character, this sort of like the filter of communication, you know, where it kind of like like the filter in which like me as an artist communicates through this filter, um, filter and meaning or feelings or any kind of communication gets made. So the fourth, um, this one final video, uh, I decided it'd be, um, be kind of interesting to kind of have that filter itself, Chantri, become an author. And so Chantri takes a form as like sort of both like a spirit and a drone at the same time. The drone being like sort of like um, the tools for recording. Like most of this video was the last video. Um, this one was recorded with this drone. And then the spirit kind of being related to um, animism, which is kind of like an idea where they're like um, spirits like 
within everything, like the table, the chair, the ground, the air, the idea that like, it's like somehow like if spirits could equal to like communicate, could like information, and then like you could have a kind of, um, just basically the duality of like, you know, like um, the kind of like technology and mysticism, you know, like those two kinds of like in-betweenness of communication or like um, could like be mapped onto each other and make this one author, which is the drone spirit. Yeah. So um, that was it. Just, so the, the drone spirit visits the temple. Um, And this video kind of, it, it reflects on a lot of um, things that for me happened in this past year, 2014, 2015. This was an uh, insulation. The narrative at the end, I guess, was about uh, emer the merging of uh, like the my character or the artist with the drone itself as this um uh kind of like a bird man and it's like a reference to this uh like mystical like Southeast Asian mystical character called the Garuda. You know, it's just like this bird man, which is basically what kind of like the drone is. It's like, you know, how you can have like a perspective of like like walking around in the perspective of like the buff. Um, yeah, it's fine. Um, I, I find it really interesting that you presented that entire narrative without reference to your performances. Right, yes. Can you kind of discuss why you find that maybe not the central aspect that needs to be discussed when we're talking about this? I guess that was how I um, framed the slide. But uh, no, so I so uh, I think I guess to me like maybe because I like because I put out like so much like materials in the past like four years. Um, to me, like some, the the thing that stuck to me was like. Kind of like now that I can, I guess I can like string through the whole like narrative for the past four years or something. But uh, yeah, I kind of miss out like the actual forms that it takes or something. I guess to me, what what is left over at the end, like at this point, is all or all the videos, which in themselves record the performances and contextualize them within the narrative themselves. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I find that really interesting. Like, uh, that's something we had talked about before as well, that I, I think where a lot of people come to your work uh, through the medium of the event and kind of the idea of the performance and how kind of this feeling of solidarity and community that you have when you're standing there. Um, but the, you have to realize that that is sort of a moment that passes um, and that maybe what's central to the practice is more of the, the film and that the film can only lock in like a certain degree of that feeling of the performance, yeah. but in a way maybe it does it better because it's able to sort of manipulate the, the before and after. Yeah. Sort of the, the film will, will string together these moments and offer an overarching narrative, whereas the performance is just kind of this one-off. Yeah. I'd say the performance is like, it, with, um, with this, in this idea of like, liveness naturally, like the way in which you can like experience the most like intensity of like, liveness would be through the performance and I think the performance are always done with like the film and I think in a way the film contextualizes it in like a moment a context and then the performance in real space which is pretty much a lot of times what you see in the film like let's say like if I'm rapping in the film then you see like a rap show live that that kind of that it almost peaks it but in terms of energy and not you know what I mean? It's it's like a point of meeting of I guess like the character or the work, you know? But I guess that's that's the thing is it's it's like um yeah, it's ephemeral and yeah, just yeah. 
would you consider yourself a, a performance artist in some way? And I guess what I mean is, uh, like this, this project belongs to a performance of becoming an artist, kind of the denim painter becoming an artist. But do you plan on continuing to use the medium of performance in other projects moving forward? I guess to to me, um, I guess to me, it's it's hard to like separate like the the like the like the performance being a medium, like itself or something, or like like completely divorced from like you know like like objects can perform and it, it, like I guess performance. Um, Yeah, it's 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 sort of like when I was when I was thinking about this this whole like project as like the performance, I was thinking about like like something of like I guess an event, but like an event that somehow could get really close to like like this you know in in when you do like a performance or like an event in an art context, there's a kind of I feel like there's a kind of openness of expectation to it where it could like it could get really close to a lecture, it could get really close to like. Concert, if it get really close to like, like, like men, men like could inhabit like these many different qualities and be almost be everything or like different things at the same time, you know. And I think, um, like, I'm, I'm still in, in that way, like, I think even an exhibition of, let's say, like, painting, let's say if you had an exhibition of, of like paintings, you know, um, they, like, how the audience meets the show, like, there's always, like, let's say, the gallerist or something who walks you through the show, or even, like, the kind of, like, the light within the space, like, how that's, you know, all these things, I, I feel like, it's, like, there's a difference between, like, a blinking light to, like, a body, you know, but in terms of, they both perform, and I guess, I always think of that, and I will always think of that. Yeah. And Nadima, I was also surprised that you didn't mention uh, Apocalypse Postponed, uh, just because that's maybe one of your most live environments, and again, provided the sort of stage for other artists to, to perform, including me. Um, could you speak to kind of what role that project played within your practice? Well, um, uh yeah, I mean, I think I think it's I probably didn't bring that up because I was trying to think about. Uh, sorry, we can't hear you, Nadine. Can you close, speak closer to the mic? Can you hear me now? Yes. Alright. I was trying to think about uh, maybe the, I guess the less obvious ways in which uh, you know hard objects uh, somehow perform or become live in that sense. Uh, Populous postponed was a project. Uh, which was a one-week thing, which involved actual performances and <coughs> bringing together musicians and uh, performances, including uh, me. Um, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess that's one. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Uh, I wonder also if we could kind of pick up on that from Crick's work and sort of this idea of, uh, obviously in, in Crick's situation it's very particular to look at this performance of kind of becoming an artist, but I wonder if there's an extent to which the act of acting as an artist is always a performance of some kind. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess definitely, I mean, I, I think, uh, if we to use that example again, uh, the, the, the Apocalypse the Stone Project, uh, because that was a collaborative <coughs> project uh, which involved uh, lots of different kind of people, but also involved working with a, with a company, which was absolutely basically sponsored the whole thing. Right? Uh, I, I also treated that uh, almost like a, as a design <coughs> project as well, which in some ways, if we think about it as that this kind of performance, was a different kind of role. Uh, I felt I felt I was taking on a different kind of role in that sense uh, as as a moderator in that in that uh, project. I guess so much so many of these things kind of become 
uh, like what Jeffrey Deitch did for so many years, right? The like art as party thing, which definitely brought a different sort of audience to the art world and created new possibilities, but I think also has kind of very clearly showed its limits now. Like the fact that you have to kind of bracket that as design, scenography, or, or um, the performance kind of has to just play a very particular role within your work. Um, do you find it increasingly important to kind of keep a distance from that sort of environment? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think, you know, you, in that whole sense, you're an artist, you work with a setup, you know, there's, there's like what, um, I guess that when I was talking about a, a filter, like, like between like you, the artist, what you want to communicate, like even like your work and then like the kind of in between, like, you know, like a lot of that is like, like media and like representation and like, you know, and, and I, I guess I, I made my work about how the of how about the forming of the author and how the author is formed so because I feel like that, that that's something that's that's like yeah that is the work and and in this day and age everything really forms the author and yeah I don't know like I mean I yeah you in a way like it's it's yeah you you end up doing some I mean or I in the past and I'm doing some of some of those projects and it's it's almost like they're the art world or the art I don't know you know it's a it's a thing that exists and behaves a certain kind of way and you kind of work with it knowing how it behaves and does that make sense yeah like I guess if you work with absolute for example you know like. There's a characteristic to like how those events are framed. People who come to those events, like and a kind of I don't know, like expectation, you know, even to the point of the graphic design of the show and all these like come hand in hand to making the meaning of what this like event is or whatever and that turns like shape the work in a certain way too and so it's 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 like very important I guess to you know. I mean, I think, I think there's there's a limitation to every situation that you 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 move into. You know, whether it's a uh, it, whether I mean, absolutely would be the, uh, an obvious example, but also uh, you know, working with a the museum, there's always a set of parameters that define uh, that context. And I think what's more interesting for me is not um, necessarily like avoiding one thing or and choosing another, but but trying to push the envelope within within each parameter as far as you can <coughs> to make that to make that uh, collaboration uh, more interesting. You know, and again, you mentioned that you had been recently picking up some physical theater and kind of thinking a lot more about um, an interplay between objects and bodies in your work. Can you describe sort of what you're thinking at the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I I've been in New York uh, for the past year on, uh, on a fellowship with the Asian Cultural Council. And uh, one of the things that I, uh, that I took up was yeah, this question of physical theater. As some of the works are primarily with objects in space, uh, I became interested in how, probably in a more connected way to this notion of performance, how, uh, how bodies uh, interact with that space. And, and was thinking of introducing um, bodies into the work as part of the work, but uh, my 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 approach to 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 this this is very new and new, and I'm still working <coughs> on it. Is to have uh, perform uh, to to construct a environment and have performers in in the environment, uh, but the performers. My objective is for the performers to become objects. So, I mean, it, it, there's a kind of paradox, right? I mean, in my work, I'm interested in animating the inanimate and turning animate beings, humans, into objects. And there's a whole other kind of narrative that frames this, but, but that, that is the main, the main objective. And, and uh, physical theater as, as a kind of style of, of, of 
Medical School of Acting, uh, uh, provided a very interesting uh, kind of technique to think about to think about this because you know, physical uh, theatre uh, is about trying to tell tell a story uh, with movement. You know, <laughs> at what point before a dialogue you know, can you tell a story uh, through gestures and things like that? And and what for me the question is you know what would be an inanimate gesture? What's, what's the gesture of an object? So, um, yeah, there's a number of paradoxes that I'm trying to, to work out with this. Um, and one of the, when we were kind of in the early stages of putting this panel together, one of the other artists who was going to be involved was Annie Kadi. Um, and I wanted to just kind of raise one of the questions I discussed with her, which was like literal liveness as a factor in kind of performative work. Uh, sort of viral liveness, like actually having living cultures, bacterial cultures. Um, and I think to bring that to, to both of you guys, you both use animals in your work at, at various points. Uh, Corker with the fish, most recently, um, Nadine with the cats. Um, can you speak to where that falls on that scale between animate and inanimate objects? Are animals kind of a prop, or are they useful for something in terms of Animating <laughs> environment in some way. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I would see it in, I would bracket it in terms of, of, of a kind of ecosystem. You know, I, I love week. I just saw the Pierre week thing yesterday at the Met, so I was thinking about it. Uh, you know, and, and uh, but you know, it doesn't necessarily have to to involve. Or the robots. The robots are kind of like animals too. Yeah, and you know, there's a kind of precursor to this, which always sort of comes back, which is like the, the notion of a real-time system that, that appears in, in Hans Hauke's work at a very early stage, before he moved on to to more political and social systems, which are also real-time but in a different way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would, I would think of it in terms of this, this ecological. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, <coughs> I guess it, for me, I, I use this fish because it, it, um, there was a there's a arowana in my, my last show, and it kind of fits in the whole entire diagram of the show as like the the naga. Um, uh, and it was like being like watched and like live broadcast by like, like a camera on the drone. And yeah, I, I guess I guess for for me like this, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it like you know it's definitely like not like an object. It's like a it's like a thing. But there's there's a kind of I think the idea of uh, the the animal itself being being like an, another being like like an animate being that's somehow like like outside of like our like system of like understanding like let's say like the exhibition or like the world you know, you know what I mean it's, it's like, like the idea of like us like the arowana especially this this kind of like some kind of like lively like you know being the naga this like mystical you know it's a sort of like a feng shui kind of fish you know where you like you like like through its kind of like like there's a lot added on to it and this activity of us like look looking at this thing and like somehow within that like con like context of the art gallery it's it's like re it's like close to you as like a living thing but it's also like really really like far away from you in that context how you understand like like the whole insulation within the frame of like art and then how like this fish itself somehow becomes like maybe like the liveliest like thing and also the like the like far most far away thing from you or something. And I guess that's in the in the whole context of the show that's what makes it like like the Nanda, like you know, this like mystical snake. You know? Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.
So I'm, I'm asked to begin. Uh, so, uh, you know, thanks, of course, to Lisa and to the all the organizers of Asia Contemporary Art Week for, <laughs> for this gift, really, for all of us, right? For inviting us, for having us participate and be part of this very stimulating two days of presentations, insights, and new friendships. Uh, um, now, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is something that we touched upon yesterday, which was a discussion on uh, performance, performativity, and even performance studies. And uh, we, we had a sort of a discussion, and I just wanted to re revisit some of the, the, the terms to offer further remarks. Um, and uh, you know, giving a bit of academic background, um, so in the last two or three decades, actually, theorizations of performance identity and and society have been very important to think about, kind of, you know, you know, in the, the, the state of affairs today, about identity today. Um, and, uh, you know, one can mention people like Judith Butler and also many theorists of, um, at NYU's, uh, you know, Department of Performance Studies who have been really active in helping us think through this, um, um, you know, uh, these notions. And, what, you know, in, in a nutshell, what they've emphasized is that previously unexamined ideas of the individual and the collective self are are not stable across time and space, right? And, and, and in any society, right? But emerge constantly in the process of being and in a process of becoming, in a, in, a, in, a, in a process that unfolds in a sense always and continues to unfold in the present, right? Um, so what I would suggest, you know, giving this uh, compressed background and just thinking about these terms, what I, would, what I would like to think about the term performance is a kind of a placeholder, or really, it's a, it's a term that kind of imperfectly captures what you know many people are trying to do, right? A, a kind of a catacrisis, if you will. Okay, a term that doesn't quite have a adequate referent, but nevertheless, we are compelled to use it, right? So we think of it as a kind of an imperfect placeholder uh, for for issues of kind of narrative ex expressiveness for iterations of the self in society. Okay, which, uh, and I think there's something important about the specificity of the term performance because it's not captured by, uh, by other terms or other mediums, right? And, um, and I think the, for me, perhaps the requirement or a definitional kind of um, notion of performance would be to say that, um, that both, the, both, the, both the performance and the audience have to be co-present, right, in the, in the unfolding of the work, right? So that's something specific to, to performance, and there's something important about the kind of the, the, the presentness and temporality of, of performance that I think we should think about, okay? So whether it's enacted as a formal practice with a frame and a platform, or whether it's a lecture performance that's structured, um, uh, whether it's a more formal way of storytelling telling or something closer to a casual conversation we might have with a friend or a stranger, over a meal, uh, performance I think captures all of these, um, you know, it's to some degree, all of these kind of uh, uh, valences. Okay, and we saw this in a number of moving and powerful interventions, um, you know, which, uh, which which kind of in a sense dealt with instruction, narrative, and persuasion, and even bullying. I would say, right? <laughs> okay, in a number of presentations, and uh, some of them are by Yen uh, Sien uh, and Aman Mujaddidi and. Uh, uh, Lanty and Z, and many others, right? Um, uh, so, and definitional terms are important, right? And in a sense, we all, you know, in an ideal world, we would like to live without, a, without, you know, kind of terms. I, of course, definitions uh, are limiting as well, right? Um, but they're important for all sorts of institutional reasons, right? Under which museums might engage with various practices, how an archive might be might record and uh, document some you know work, okay? How grant agencies might you know give grants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So, um, so having stated all of these uh, kind of caveats, okay, one, I think one one should acknowledge that there is something liberating about performance, and uh, you know, one is that it can have this kind of a wide ambit, right? Um, and also in the sense that the self is, you know, it acknowledges the, the, the idea that the self is in the process of becoming, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a process. So it's a movement, a process, a sense of becoming, okay? And, um, uh, and th so there's something open-ended also about, about performance that is not the case in perhaps in many object-based kind of uh, works of art, right? Okay. Um, now, we come to, but of course we are here at the Asian Contemporary Art Week, right? And, um, uh, Asia Contemporary Art Week, and so the, the, the term Asian also kind of 
rears its head. Okay, so what is Asian about? You know this process, this journey, this kind of uh, this uh, this unfolding, right? And um, I think we have to think about this again. There's something. Uh, there's, there, there can be the, the, the term Asia or Asian can be uh, can have positive valences provided we in a sense handle it carefully, right? Um, and um, uh, we saw a wide range of practices and uh, you know concerns here. Some obviously more Asian looking than others, right? Uh, but the sense of what Asian being Asian is and how global and sort of local identities and forces are at work, okay? Um, and, you know, in a sense in the world today, they're constantly at work interjecting and traversing any claim closures, okay? Um, and I think this question of in kind of interjection, okay, and penetration of close categories is precisely what is at stake, okay, today and especially at stake in kind of issues of performance and performance art, right? Okay, now uh, one can one can think about three kind of in a sense uh, terms here. One is the the term Asian, the second is performance, and the third is contemporary. And one can kind of in a sense think about the relationships between these terms in a number of ways, right? Um, um, now we all know that the term Asian is problematic, obviously. Okay, and uh, it um, you know it has a checkered history, right? And uh, and today it characterizes the majority of the world's population. So one, it's not even clear how useful, frankly, uh, the term Asian is, right? Um, uh, and you know, these are and these are, you know, if you talk about Asia, you're talking about societies that are as radically different, perhaps, from each other than as any in the world, right? Uh, nevertheless, I think this term can do some work for us, provided we remain open to its kind of openness to its being reinscribed, right? Um, and I think performance has that capacity or the potential to do that, right? And to put it kind of clumsily, Asia can characterize societies with long and deep traditions, okay, of, of ritual, performance, living, okay, etc., right? And um, uh, just to give an example, the Kama Sutra, right, begins by describing numerous arts of living, okay? And, uh, and uh, there are something like, I don't know, 64 arts of living or kalas, right? And many of these kalas or arts of living wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be wouldn't be captured under the terms of object-based art, okay? But uh, once you have, in a sense, the, the 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 question that art can be also performance, I think it opens up, okay, the the category of art to all sorts of reinscriptions of tradition, okay, in Asia. That's a very important way for kind of you know people you know thinking about Asia to think about the question of the past and its relation to the present and the future, right? Now, of course, these traditions can be hierarchical, patriarchal, and oppressive as they are, right? But they can also be quite radical, okay? Can also illuminate new paths for us uh, to new futures. They can be spiritual, they can be everyday, and they can be much more open towards the closures of things like gender and identity than other art forms, okay? They can be radically queer, right? In the sense of non-normativity and strangeness, right? Okay. And I think we see some of this in the works of uh, work of uh, Bing Yi and uh, you know the, her work in relation to both kind of nature and to 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 the to the tradition of ink painting. Uh, Nazakat uh, Akisi's complex critique of religious edicts, uh, you know, done very powerfully in her in her presentation. Um, Li Mingui's meditative projects with the Bodhi tree and sand painting, and Qasim Reza Shaheen's exploration of Sufism and the question of narcissism and the ego, which is reformulated in the age of celebrity, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and just now we saw Korakrit uh, Aruna Nonchai's investigation of, you know, in some sense, technological states of possession, okay? <laughs> and trances and possession, okay? Uh, uh, and Ming Wong's forthcoming, uh, you know, Cantonese sci-fi opera, Okay, which would think about the future in, with reference uh, via kind of you know forms of the past and and and, and forms of modernity, um, and this leads me to my next observation, which is of course that Asia and Asians hardly exist in the world today in her hermetic isolation, right? As Nadim Abbas's pro projects demonstrates through their, and I quote, uh, psychodrama of performance, okay. Um, the, in which the inside and the outside are put in a kind of a complex kind of dialectical relation, right? 
And in fact, it's quite, uh, quite the reverse that Asia is isolated. In fact, Asia is fully immersed in processes of globalization. And these exist from the earliest eras of history, right? Um, but now are in kind of, in a sense, uh, still in acceleration in the contemporary era. Uh, so with the speed of urbanization, the rise of modern institutions, new social structures, uh, tradition is also in, in a state of, uh, various states of kind of crisis and transformation, right? Um, and in some ways, this is what performance can do for us is to, in a sense, recover the best of what tradition might mean and make it available, okay, for the present and the future, right? Okay. Um, now, in terms of thinking about Asia and its relation to the world, we saw that in a number of uh, uh, works here. Uh, uh, Jeff Cyclowski's work nicely brought up kind of, you know, kind of youth culture and abstract painting in a kind of, uh, if that's a great example. Uh, and we see the question of, uh, you know, uh, of kind of the modality and the re relationality of globalization very seriously uh, taken up by the pro various projects of Rux Media Collective. Um, Christopher Ho's lecture on the de what I would call the demented liminality of Asianness, okay, <laughs> in the world today, I think is provocative and apt, okay. Uh, Liu Ding and uh, Tang uh, Tishin's readings and performances, I think, show very well how the how both the world and the body and the self in China today have a particular charge, right? Uh, in terms of coming, in, in, in the sense of coming to terms with the profound transformations unfolding there. And uh, Vibha Galhotra compels us all to confront the reality of Asia, right? Which should temper any triumphalism we might be tempted to claim for it, okay? Um, which is the center of pollution in the world today, right? Okay. So, um, so I want to begin to close my remarks by making, uh, you know, a few, um, uh, saying a few words on the question of the archive and research, okay? And uh, I think uh, Diane Lewis yesterday enlightened us to the genealogy of the term performance, okay, as uh, it emerged in architectural uh, terms during uh, the European Enlightenment. Um, uh, Istiman Husjan's residency in Seoul made us all aware of how interconnected conceptual and earth art was globally, even in, you know, as early as the late 60s, right? And Nora Taylor's work uh, showed how a living archive can be immensely productive and liberatory for performance, even in a society like Singapore, which arguably has kind of, you know, better documentation and better art, art institutions than many other parts of Asia, right? Um, so as an art historian, for me, these are, these are all fantastic lessons for us, uh, both for the need to think, to have some sense of humility in seeing our own kind of both research work as well as performance work with some acknowledgement of what has preceded us, okay? And the continued, continued need, I think, for research and scholarship in documenting, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the particularly ephemeral, and, you know, and site and time-based nature of performance, which is particularly slip, slippery in terms of uh, uh, the question of documentation. Uh, so just in closing, uh, let me say that the, the need, the, the question of Asia as a concept, okay, should be thought about in a productive relation of crisis with globalization, okay, and uh, that we can think through with this, with the, with this, the third term, which is contemporary. Uh, and, uh, and here again, the nature of performance opens up, opens it up nicely, since performance has to be enacted, enactment carries all the potentialities of responding creatively right now to the dilemma one faces today. In other words, you don't have, in other words, the, every time you do a performance, it has to be, uh, in, in, in a sense, a new performance. And it has to embody all the issues and tensions and problems, okay, that one faces as one is doing the performance right now. Um, so at its best, this, this Asian part of contemporary performance, I don't know, can recover and remold tradition and the questions we face today for the present and the future, not just for quote unquote Asia, but for everyone who lives with us, okay, and will follow us, okay. In this sense, the term, uh, the terms contemporary performance in Asia, I think this, this, uh, this constellation could not be a more apt uh, set of terms for us to think through and work through today. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to do something. Um, I would like to ask you for one more thing, please. 
it's uh, it's terrifying to do this, but uh, I would like to, to end today uh, with a little bit of a ritual. And the ritual is, uh, everybody just stay in your seat, put your stuff down, please, your hands free, if you can. Um, and I'm just gonna ask each one of you to stand up um, and um, in turn, not everybody all at once. Um, and just say one word uh, that comes to you from the heart, the head, wherever, um, about the last two days. Just one word, okay? So this way we can end today um, with something, uh, a gift for all of us. And uh, just in the notion and the closing remarks of Eftahar, um, going with so much to, to, to eat and um, chew and digest, to have these words with us. So um, I'll start. Happiness. Alive. Go ahead. We'll go like this. We'll just go around like that. Convergent. You stand up. Okay, you stand up and say your word. Asian. <laughs> Everybody has to do this, so you can't, you can't escape. Friendship. Understanding. Understanding. Uh-huh. Dinner. Dinner. <laughs> Talks. Empathy. Observation. Engagement. Engagement. Hello? Courage. Courage. Courage and? Think. Think. Pig. No. Pig. Pig. A pig is amongst us. All right. No. Pig. Pig. Oh, pink. <laughs> okay. Shoda, what's your word? Ashchocho. Ashchocho? Kya hai? Can you tell me which language <laughs> That's okay, we'll keep it. We'll just feel it. Okay. Um, H E Masters. What's your word? Okay, Murtaza? Bodies? Bodies? Millions of birds. Luncheon? Ship? Are we done? Don't lose your opportunity. Okay, and I'll offer someone else's word. That's hesitation. <laughs> we live with it all the time. Okay, thank you so much. Have a beautiful evening.